What's up guys? Fahan here. Welcome back to another Autobot review. This is the review of the Royal Enfield Himalayan 450. Huge thanks to Royal Enfield Singapore for loaning me this bike for the review. By the way guys, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel Hit that subscribe button below Why? The YouTube algorithm will push out these videos to a wider audience And we need all the help we can get Okay, so finally, we are back for another Autobot review Welcome back to the city of Bedini And here I have with me is the Royal Enfield Himalayan 450 <laughs> Although this isn't Royal Enfield's flagship Which should have been, by the way The Himalayan update has been been highly anticipated by fans of it. Once it's been unveiled, Royal Enfield shamelessly promoted the heck out of this bike knowing that it's gonna appease the press and the bikers. Everything down here as you can see has been redesigned from the ground up from its general design, its engine, its chassis. Nothing is carried over from its predecessor. And before I continue on, uh, the reason why I'm saying Himalayan is because that's the correct way to pronounce the word <laughs> basically uh, the Himalayan is much more of a, a British or English kind of pronunciation but because I've been to Ladakh and rode there on a Himalayan 411 so it's only right that I use the proper pronunciation for Himalayan scale on the bike right now ah. Whew, and I have to say getting on board it really brings back of my memories back in India when I rode the <laughs> Himalayan 411 and Scram 411 in the dark in Kashmir. Wow, it feels really familiar. Lah. Uh, if you've ridden the 411 before, we are in for a surprise when you try to ride the 450. It feels slightly different, but at the same time, it's somewhat similar to the 411 and what you ex expected out of it. Lah. Um, enough chatting, let's start the bike. Ah. This is a key, and you can see the 4 inch. TFT gauge car still lighting up and it still manages to keep its retro look. So start the bike. <laughs> Let's go. Oh man. Riding on it for the first time, my first impressions wise, there's some slight improvement compared to its predecessor. But overall, I feel that it's somewhat handling its overall performance Still feels similar to the 411 Though for this one, you feel as if it's slightly faster In terms of torque, in terms of acceleration And even the top speed Handling this bike has got some bit to it uh. At 196 kg, 4 kilos lighter than its predecessor So it really makes no difference in my personal opinion I think in terms of stability, it really helps But I somewhat feel that it's a bit top heavy yeah. especially when I'm pushing the bike or try to mount the mount onto the bike and I'll come to this in the static review but if you ask me overall the handling feels slightly better the performance feels slightly better Ooh, and the suspension wise whoa man we got Showa front Fox and a Monoshock in the rear so suspension wise wow I feel that it can take on anything and everything man that comes his way The suspension is very soft, very comfortable it really absorbs most of the bumps and road imperfections And it provides this, this nice comfortable ride And I can barely feel most of the road markings also <laughs> The guys back at uh, Royal Enfield Singapore, they, uh, they tell me lah If you have a chance to try out this bike in off-road Do try it off-road Also the brakes we got Vibrate brake calipers front and rear Dual channel ABS with the ability to off the rear brake So you can power slide easily <laughs> So right now we in performance mode With ABS on And we also got eco mode If you ask me there's no difference between the two lah I think in eco mode it's slightly more sluggish But first and foremost is Royal Enfield It is It's supposed to be that Melo bike, comparing this to most other Royal Enfields that I've ridden before This is by far the best performing lah But 
it's still not as wonderful as those other mainstream brands but given the reputation that Royal Enfield holds in the motorcycling world this is expected lah. and if you've ridden Royal Enfield before you are in for a treat lah. this bike is really a huge improvement over its predecessor especially the 411 I just cannot get over on how easy it is you know when you got on board when you hop on board you ride it nice basically no learning curve I think if you're a new class 2 rider you've never ridden other bike before other than the one in driving school and your first bike is a Himalayan 450 I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna tell you you're able to take on anything and everything with this bike so acceleration wise whoa <laughs> actually not too bad eh? not too bad it's kind of talky and definitely you're able to avoid people tailgating you or any sticky situations that you might face <laughs> they quickly get up there, you know. Woo, man. A successor to the ever popular Himalayan 411, the Royal Enfield Himalayan 450 is an adventure motorcycle built and optimized for the rough mountain passes and high altitude of the Himalayan mountain range. Mechanically spartan in nature, with some slight tech added, the Himalayan 450 was made to address the shortcomings and feedback of its predecessor. Named as the Sherpa engine, after a Tibetan ethnic groups of the Himalayans, its Royal Enfield's first-ever liquid-cooled motor, a 452cc single-cylinder DOHC with electronic fuel injection and a six-speed manual transmission. The development of the Himalayan 450 is pretty interesting. Firstly, Enfield came up with a bike and they let riders from the company and journalists ride it as well. They conducted real-world test rides at the Himalayans, trashing it with the riders, giving input. Feedback is taken and improvements are made. Balancing out with the different specs and configurations, and voila, this is what you get. Okay guys, so as usual, I'm gonna start with the riding posture. Okay, so sitting on this bike right now, as you can see, typical adventure bike riding position. Okay, very upright, back straightened. My legs folded in quite a bit, long and wide handlebars provide a nice comfortable grip on the bike. I got a commanding view of the road right in front of me. Everything is within eye glance, like I can see the gauge cluster, the buttons very easily. And it's just a very nice and comfortable riding position. Certainly something that I'm used to, certainly something that I'm okay with lah. Okay guys, so I'm 165 and with a ride height of 82.5 cm and adjustable to 84.5 cm. Okay, this seat is currently adjusted at the lowest possible setting which is 82.5 and I'm still doing quite a bit. I think for me, vertically challenged riders, no issues because they have made the Himalayan 450 with shorter riders in mind so that many riders can ride it. Uh, there's also a short seat option that you can purchase but I'm not really sure how many millimeters that shaves off but for me, it's okay lah and I find that mounting on the bike was also very easy also Pushing the bike actually feels a bit top heavy This is evident by myself mounting on the bike where I need to push a bit to get it to the upright riding position like this a bit of a struggle there lah <laughs> for some reason and also the side stand leans too much to the left I'm not sure why they did that possibly maybe because the, it's top heavy they don't want it to tip over but still it's a bit too tilted to the left lah alright guys so I'm next to come to the design and compared to the 411 definitely the 450 is an evolution of it Sleeker, curvy and mellow Described to be more modern looking and tapered down than its predecessor There's some mixed reviews of the 450's design But despite this, it still retains its overall charm and retro outlook Notably, the upper tank guards remain Nicely tapered to the headlight bowl, to the full tank Reviewers have praised it for its functionality as well as its ruggedness during drops The addition of little slits and brackets lets riders strap bags and other storage to the tank guards also, the Himalayan branding on the fuel tanks edge is a nice touch The high front mud guard provides an ADV scramblish look to the bike Somewhat similar to the bigs commonly found on adventure motorcycles <laughs> I also like that the front fender has fog protectors on it With the Himalayan branding on it Cleaner look with the brake light within the indicators Seat contours to the tapered design 
spoke rims with semi off-road tyres. Additionally, for this particular model, the tyres are also a tube type. High ground clearance at 23 cm due to better chassis setup. The twin spa frame is stronger and stiffer with the 452 cc engine being part of the chassis also and this actually removes the chassis support for the engine below Overall, it's simple, functional, back to basics It's how I generally describe the Himalayan 450 Up next, we come to the handlebar, handlebar controls and gauge cluster Okay, so for the handlebar, once again, it's this long and flat handlebar which is pretty comfortable My arms aren't too stretched out, nor am I struggling to get a grip on the handlebar And the handlebar grip is also very soft and nice to the touch eh? uh, If you've ridden a Royal Enfield before, the running controls are very much similar you got the old school tap buttons for the light switches and the starter and kill switch But because there's some uh, technology involved and also the fact that you can control uh, more features on the bike There's certain things that you may see for the first time on a Royal Enfield Especially this on the left over here Okay, we got a joystick to toggle and adjust the features accordingly on the TFT gauge cluster and then to the left of it we got the horn on top of that we got the signal indicators and on top of that we got the tab for the lightings high beam low beam and in front over here we got the home button which is to go to the home page on the TFT gauge cluster which I'm gonna come to in a bit okay to right over here we got the kill switch Hazard in the front and the mode button over here So you can toggle between two riding modes, eco mode and performance mode So you can actually switch off the ABS for both modes as well But this is only applies to the rear ABS The front ABS is still turned on So you're able to perform power slides like you're on a KTM <laughs> Up next we come to the 4 inch round TFT cage cluster So there's one port and it has a pretty old school shape Pretty much in line with all the Royal Enfield bikes But uh, it's a TFT gauge cluster So turn it on, we got the Himalayan branding And we got an old school style tachometer in digital form <laughs> and Then we got the time, the temperature, speedometer Currently the side stand is down so the side stand indicator is on The gear indicator and below that is the odometer The fuel gauge surrounding the inner tachometer and other warning lights below Okay, so to adjust the riding mode, you press the M and the right handlebar control Okay, so currently it's showing right mode Performance ABS on Rear ABS off And then we got Eco mode ABS on And Rear ABS off Unfortunately, you cannot adjust the riding modes while you're riding So make sure you need to come to a complete stop or before you even uh, move off lah. Okay, so um, other things that you can toggle with Press the center of the joystick You got trip 1 and trip 2 Fuel range Fuel consumption Voltage And service is overdue but they actually serviced this bike before I got a hand before I got a hold of it but because this is his first servicing after 500 kilometers it will prompt lah and engine temperature and that's it So you can also use pair with the Roy Enfield app I'm already connected to the app to my phone Let's start with navigation Okay we go to Ikea lah eh. Okay, get directions Okay, so start navigation The triple navigation will display on the TFT accordingly If you don't want to put your phone on your handlebar like me You want to still use the maps, right? Perhaps you can use the TFT gauge cluster to find your way around lah. And I think it's a good option lah, if you ask me Because I don't want my phone sensor Camera to be spoiled, no, my phone flying away while I'm riding. <laughs> By pressing up on the joystick, you can toggle other settings as well. The gauge cluster appearance, you can toggle on what you want to display in the main gauge cluster. There's a dark theme as well. Unfortunately, there's no bright theme, so depending on the light sensor, it will automatically darken the TFT display. For screen type, there's an analog option and digital option. The digital display prominently shows the menu options and other displays such as navigation and music. While in the analog option, menu options and other displays are displayed at the bottom of the screen. Retaining the analog look. You can also toggle your music accordingly through the joystick.
Other menu options include trip preference, my vehicle, system, information, and favorites. Okay guys, so up next is one of the features that I want to talk about is the adjustable seat height. So you can you know, adjust the seat height simply by opening the rear balance seat. And additionally, we got two kit and also the owner's manual, manual over here. And by removing the seat, you can see these seat bars. Simply adjust them accordingly and voila, you got a higher seat. It takes a while to line up properly, but you get the hang of it eventually. And then simply close back. And to adjust back, simply just take the height bars and adjust them back accordingly. Make sure to slot the seat in properly. And I also love the seat. Very grippy. Your butt doesn't really slide around when you're riding. And I love these two-tone colors that come with it. And there's also a Royal Enfield branding over here. My general comment is that after riding it for quite a while, your butt tends to get sore. Lah. So I think maybe Royal Enfield wants you to stand on the bike as you're riding. And I also like this luggage rack right here. It's a huge update compared to the previous uh, 411. You can actually accommodate a bracket to put a box on it. Lah. So up next, you come to Riding Tech and being a Royal Enfield, um, this is probably Royal Enfield's most advanced motorcycle yet. Some of the riding tech, you've probably seen it on other mainstream bikes as well. Um, but if you ask me, it's better late than never with the stuff that the Himalayan is going to go through, right? Um, definitely, this riding tech is necessary. Lah. But despite all of this riding tech, right, it still managed to retain the retro uh, charm that the Himalayan is always known to, eh, to be. Lah. Okay, so first and foremost, we have full LED lighting all around. Right by wire throttle, two riding modes, eco mode and performance mode, slipper clutch, hazard lights, dual channel ABS packed with Bibri big calipers with the ability to turn off the rear ABS. For suspension, we got non adjustable 43 mm inverted Showa cartridge Fox in the front and a non adjustable Showa monoshock in the rear placed almost horizontally for better mass centralization. Something that we've already seen in Kawasaki motorbikes recently. USB-C port, a full color 4 inch TFT gauge cluster, and Bluetooth connectivity through the Royal Enfield app. Alright, guys, so I'm next to come to colors. So there's actually three trims that you can choose from. Okay, we got the base trim, the pass trim, and the summit trim. So the one we're reviewing right now is part of the pass trim line. This is in slate poppy blue. The other color is slate Himalayan salt. For the base trim, there's only one color which is the Kaza brown. And finally, we come to the summit trim in which there's Kamet white and Hana black. Additionally, for the summit line, it comes with tubeless tires lah, and the rest, they're all using a tube type of tire. Right guys, so I'm next to come to the price and according to Royal Enfield Singapore, for the base and pass trim lines, the machine price is $13,000. And for the summit trim, which is the tubeless tire, is thirteen thousand nine hundred. Okay, so warranty is three years, unlimited mileage. And you guys can also talk to the sales team for more details and arrange for a test ride. For the Malaysian market, so far there is no details on the price yet. But the price for the four eleven, which is the older model in Malaysia, is twenty nine thousand ringgit. Okay, so let's change it to eco mode. Not really too keen on the stock windshield though, or the fly screen as Roy Enfield says. But they are aftermarket ones. Ooh, even in eco mode, I feel that some slight difference, but basically little to none of it. Now I am tempted to go on to this uh, motocross track over here. Let's see if we can. <laughs> Go ah, Medini motocross track. Obviously, I'm not supposed to be here, but I am gonna test out the bike's capabilities. Okay, we got performance mode ABS turn off right now. <laughs> really brings back memories of my trip in Ladakh. Oh man! Oh, oh shit! <laughs> That's okay. Back to first gear. I didn't accelerate enough. Then again, I'm not riding a motocross bike. Uh, 
Oh, oh my god, <laughs> so scary. I never encountered this in Ladakh, no. Disclaimer, guys, I'm not much of an off road rider. No, I'm a motocross rider. But yeah, I prefer not to bring in this off road condition. Oh my god I cannot I gotta get out of here <laughs> The hills, they're scaring me <laughs> Oh my god, I just jumped through that Oh Oh man <laughs> Ooh, let's get out of here. That was really something. How would I describe that off-road experience? Terrible. <laughs> oh no, I'm clearly not built for off-road. But uh, that was nerve-wracking. My fear was dropping the bike. But thank God. It was okay. <laughs> After that nerve-wracking off-road experience, I don't think I want to bring the bike off-road. Anymore, unless it's my bike, or unless this bike is uh is loaned out to me for the purpose of riding off road. <laughs> I have to bring this bike out in one piece. Even though you know that the Himalayan can take on the off road. So as much as this bike is a global bike, in right and fuels press releases and advertising, it's mostly targeted and built for the Himalayan. With the feedback received. They also want this bike to also be ridden easily and catch up with the high speeds of the motorways and the highways. You are able to go above 100, no problem on this bike. But I feel like it's comfortable cruising speed is around 80, 90. That's what it's most comfortable at lah. No problems if you want to pick up and accelerate faster because at a twist of a throttle, <laughs> the bike can go eh? And there's this nice sounding growl that uh, the bike screams when it's accelerating eh? So let's push her to the limit <laughs> Okay, 110 Oh man Ichi puts tension that she managed to get to 150 with the Himalayan and she says that it's able to go even faster than that oh not too bad eh wow I missed the price for a Himalayan it's able to keep up with the highway traffic and you don't feel it screaming or struggling at all and I feel that it can even go much faster but if you ask me I feel comfortable at this bike in at 80 or 90 lah that's his most comfortable speed and that is what I'm comfortable at also it's not a bike whereby he screams performance but, but at the same time you wouldn't want to estim underestimate the bike either if it's unassuming look I mean if you ask me uh, it feels like a sleeper and it's more than capable of speeds above 100 but we shall see on its appeal in the Singaporean and Malaysian market lah. It's a huge improvement over the 411. It deserves its place in the motorcycling world. Alright guys, so I've had like one week with the Right and Fit Himalayan 450. And I have to say for $13,000 is really bang for your buck for an ADV. Riding tech is really decent on par with other modern machines out there very beginner friendly if you ask me any rider is able to hop on and adapt to it pretty quickly great handling great suspension decent power as for the shortcomings i feel that on its side stand it leans too much to the left i highly don't recommend you to mount the bike using the foot packs on the side stand as it's gonna tip over and overall, I feel that this bike may not appeal to mainstream class 2 riders given that usually Singaporeans, they would tend to max out the CC of their purchased bike. If you ask me, 450cc is quite close 
to 400 and riders usually are more keen to go something above 700 900 lah because given that in singapore we really have to earn our licenses and it may not appeal lah to the mainstream customers but rather i think it will appeal to more niche riders who basically know what this bike is all about lah and what it's capable of that's such a pity and riders tend to overlook just because it's 450 cc and it's a mellow and gentle bike it's not really that fast but i feel that if you overlook all this it's more than capable of a lot of things lah as right and field continues to adapt to the 21st century needs of riders it needs to strike a balance between having this riding tag, price and design. I don't think they want to be another Triumph or Harley Davidson in that aspect. But Royal Enfield has always had the right price, no matter the bike. The priority is to make it accessible to its home market and at the same time satisfy the needs of the grueling and rugged terrain of the Himalayans. Simple, straightforward machine with all the necessary riding tech will appeal to certain riders of its niche. I personally think the broader appeal lies in the international market, uh, particularly such as Delta in America, Europe, subcontinental India, where such terrain exists. Lah. For me, I hope to be back in Ladakh, this time riding a 450 Himalayan, and we're just going to see how capable this bike is. Lah. Whew. So once again, huge thanks to Royal Enfield Singapore for lending me this bike for the review. And once again, Test Ride is available for this bike. So you can come on down to the showroom, do inquire on to the sales staff or more details. Whew. Okay, so that's it for the vlog. We'll see you guys in the next one.